Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Mental Toughness and Body Show. My name is Rob Evans. I'm a transformation coach, health strategist, and internationally published author, helping take your life and your business, your health, fitness, mindset, and body from where you are right now to where it is that you want to be. I've got a great guest with me today. It's James Bennett from All Access Holidays. And today we're going to talk about not just James's business model, because it's a really good example of niching and niching really deeply, but also talk about the challenges that have been in place for him during COVID and so forth, the, the way forward and, and so forth. So James, welcome to the call. G'day, Rob. Thanks for having me, mate. No problem. So James, maybe to give the audience a, a bit of an idea of what it is that you do, um, maybe first of all, talk about that. And then I, I want to um, get you to explain, you know, why you've chosen that particular niche. So tell us okay. about, about, about what you do. Thanks, Rob. So uh, back in about 2017, um, I started a, a company called All Access Holidays. And All Access Holidays was created in order to uh, provide and offer um, supported holidays for people with disabilities. So to give you an example, we will run a holiday of maybe four to 12 people and we'll take them to a select destination around Australia. And we can also do abroad as well. And what All Access Holidays does is it provides everything from the accommodation, the transportation, the activities, the food and drink, the whole shebang. We pick up at the door, we drop off at the door, and we also ensure that the holidays for someone with a disability can be as seamless as possible. That's our group holidays. Um, we also do one-to-one -one holidays. Now, these are more tailored programs. Uh, so, you know, there's sometimes people who have a disability um, it may be fairly mild um, and they don't really feel that they fit in with a group as such. Uh, they may have something on their bucket list that they want to do. So what they'll do is they'll contact us and they'll say, hey, look, we want to put together a, a holiday to, for example, Spain or Japan or the UK or somewhere around Australia. And when we're on these, this holiday, uh, we would like to you know, do certain things. So. For example, we took a gentleman to Japan a few years ago. Um, on his bucket list was, um, I think it was Disneyland in Tokyo. Um, he wanted to see, um, he wanted to see Osaka Castle, and he wanted to ride on the Shinkansen, which is a bullet train. So okay. we put that all together as an itinerary. We ensured that he had a carer that went with him, that was able to work with him to facilitate that trip, um, and all the rest of it, and then. A more recent thing that we've added to our program is that uh, we've bought a respite centre down on Phillip Island. Uh, Phillip okay. Island is, is an island in Victoria, um, and which is in Australia. And um, so what we do there is this house is fully accessible. So it's got ramps, it's got hospital beds, it's got hoists, it's got roll-in bathrooms. Um, so someone that's in a wheelchair, an electric wheelchair, they can know that if they come and stay at one of stay at this particular property, they're not going to have face any of the issues or the challenges, uh, which can commonly be faced by someone with mobility issues. So, you know, perhaps, you know, if they go to, for example, uh, a regular hotel, there'll be steps leading up to the room, um, yeah. or there'll be, you know, any any number of things which can impede someone that's in a wheelchair or has mobility issues. But it's also one of those things that if you are able-bodied you sort of take for granted you don't consider yes. Yes. um so this particular um respite center was basically um created with um uh, but it was created around a, a gentleman that became a quadriplegic in later life so it's completely tailored it's absolutely perfect um so they're the sort of the three strands of what we do so yeah the great overview with the um, just so I can understand, the you said somebody with a mild disability that you may do a one-on-one -on -one experience with. What would be some examples of something that would fall into that category? So obviously not to, not necessarily physical. It may be an intellectual. Yeah, look, I suppose when I say mild disability, it it it's, it's, it can it's not exactly subjective, but. Um, it really depends on the person. So to give you an example, uh, you know, we took a gentleman away to Adelaide. He really wanted to see the churches and stuff like that. Now, he works. He works independently. Um, but there's no way he could ever get on a plane or there's no way that so he could that do more it. anxiety that... Uh, 
No, that was probably more intellectual. I mean, he's able to okay. con- able to carry a complete conversation with you. Really, really good guy, but he wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, sort of traverse all of the, you know, so get everything the for the airport and the plane and commuting and all that. Catching a bus is beyond him. Handling yeah. money, um, you know. Another example is of. Um, I think I mentioned the bloke we took to Japan. Yeah. Um, you know, he was in the latter stages of Huntington's disease, probably not much longer to live. Um, so he didn't have an intellectual disability as such, but he definitely needed a lot of help to get around. Um, yeah, so when I say a mild intellectual disability, um, it really sort of... Yeah, it's it not depends, something right? to pinpoint exactly, yeah. sure. <laughs> So look, I think what you do is a like it's an amazing, amazing service, and uh, I think you've got a great uh, website. Uh, it's Australian All Access Holidays, isn't it? So it's um... uh, so it's www.allaccessholidays.com. Yeah, right. Um, it's I think when when I think about what you do there, I can't think of anyone else that does what you do. So I suppose a couple of questions coming out that from a business perspective. What was your your drive to uh, set up a business that's catering for the, you know, the all access holidays? So I've I've always well, since I, I came I'm from the UK originally, and since coming to Australia in about two thousand and seven, I've pretty much exclusively worked in in some sort of area of disability. Now, when I actually came here initially, I worked for a company that did something similar to what we do now. Um, yeah. and, I, and I did it did it for a few years, and then after a while, I I, I went off and I, and I worked in worked in other areas. And about 2015, I started off um, uh, an aged care company in recruitment. I did that for a couple of years, and it really really wasn't. I suppose it wasn't going especially well. Um, we were at the point where we either grew a lot or we sort of we stayed where we were. But if we stayed where we were, the stress was sort of you know pretty challenging and if we grew we didn't really have the finances to um put the money into that growth so in about 2017 I, I just I was speak talking to my wife and I said look I used to do this um it was it was just a, a sort of a, a seed a germ of an idea um to do it and I, I can't remember if I'd come across a brochure there was something that sort of brought it to mind and I just said to my wife look I've worked in disability I know what I'm doing let's put why don't we just I'm going to try this. I'm, I'm sick to death of aged care recruitment. It's not worth it. It's mm. too stressful. Um, and I just wanted to try something different. Um, so, you know, you know, the first year when we started, it was really, really slow. Yes. <laughs> um, I suppose also I, I wanted to do it because like yourself, you know, um, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. I like to work on my own terms. I like to, um, I felt like it was an area, it was, uh, you know, a, a niche area where there could potentially be a lot of growth. Um, yes. And also this, because it's a specialist area within a specialist area, uh, there's really, there's, I mean, there is a little bit of competition, but there's not heaps of it either. No, so, it's not. you know, I just felt like the, the opportunities for growth uh, were really there. And just from a personal perspective, point of view as well I, you know I, I really wanted to um I guess offer something a bit different I wanted to do something a bit different I didn't want to go back into you know corporate or office life and mm. doing nine to five and sort of slowly burn out that way well I probably wouldn't have burned out slowly it would have been fairly quickly yeah. <laughs> uh, look I guess it's very rewarding work too because not only do you get the like the tremendous feedback from the person that is uh, you know, participating, but it's the family as well. Was there can be a little bit of respite for them and being able to deliver a service that they don't have access to necessarily the the resources and the uh, you know you, you can obviously you know put together some really snazzy packages for people. And if there is somebody that has a disability, and I think well they would love to go overseas, but in their mind they can never see how that's possible. Well, you're the dream maker and make that that happened for them so um you know i think it's like it's an awesome service now i wanted to talk about uh, some of the challenges with covid now i don't want to no spoiler alert here but i think uh, we were having a conversation a while ago and you told me about this so i'm i'm hoping you're going to relay the same story and i've got the order right but obviously with uh, covid here 
um, you're in uh, regional Victoria, me being in, in metro, so you weren't locked down quite as much as we are, were here, but I guess a lot of your clients are, are in metro and wouldn't have been able to travel and so forth. But um, forgive me if I've got this wrong, but didn't you do something very specific during COVID to keep your business running and to provide a unique service or have I just thrown you completely in the deep end and you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, you've got some you've got some things right. I'm not sure where you got the latter part. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I was actually in Metro at the time. So okay. we moved to the region a couple of years ago, sort of in one of the, you know, one of the lockdowns, which I can't recall which one it was. There were so many of them. Um, uh I'm thinking about the vans. That's what I'm thinking about. Was that an initiative that came out of COVID? The what, sorry? Your vans, your, your portable accommodation and stuff that you no. picked up? No. Not Does the that have nothing to do with Oh, COVID? okay, sorry. No, so we have wheelchair accessible vans, um, but they're more used to be like we hire them out. We don't, they're not sort of like roving holiday Um Sort of Winnebago's. <laughs> so I thought that I thought they were like caravan type things that you said you hide out. No, we no, they're just they're just no. I suppose, yeah, I can see how you might think that. Yeah, I never really I said this is the the difference between Poms and Aussies. You said van and you know how popular they've been and stuff. And I thought, oh right, so it's a an accommodation van that's all accessible and that. And I thought, what a unique idea. Well done. That's probably a really good idea. Yeah. All right. I'm leaving the show now. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, it's no. So they're just. I mean, like they are pretty popular. Um, but no, they're That's just. That's why bad. I thought it was such a good idea. So I've just given you another good business. You've just given idea. me another great idea. Well, you know, in actual fact, um, there is a there is a company that does that. So they they provide like they fit out Winnebagos and caravans and stuff like that. So it's quite a popular. It's another sort of thing that mm. um, could be looked into. Um, but yeah, we don't actually do it ourselves. But right. to, to 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 give you a sort of an oversight, what happened in COVID? So last year we did, I think it was about thirty seven or thirty eight holidays. Um, in twenty twenty, when we were shut down in March, I think for the whole of twenty twenty, we did five holidays. Yeah. Um, so we did our sort of initial few, and then there's sort of the fear mongering sort of kicked in yeah. and you know it was permeating the media then people were cancelling holidays on mass uh so yeah and then we were eventually shut down in march and then we didn't do then some of the restrictions which were in place so you know the 5k rule yeah um what is it the ring of steel so yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah. um that you couldn't be with anyone else other than like someone who you live with yes that's and right then, and then even when they did drop, do you remember when they would drop some of the restrictions and they'd bring them back in? And yeah. They were so nonsensical that no one could follow them. So they bought in one once where they said, well, you, this was, I think it was about November of 2020. Um, <clears throat> they said, oh, well, you, you can have accommodation, but if you stay in that accommodation, it has to be with other family members. So which instantly, yes, you know, you meant, yes. meant, meant that we couldn't do it. Um, but, you know, in saying that in 2021, because so many uh, of our clientele had been locked away for, you know, the preceding sort of nine months, mm. the first six months until whichever lockdown was imposed after that, we were flat chat. Um, so, um, yeah, there was a real sort of eagerness. Well, there's a the real part. hunger for travel even now. I mean, just look at last week, Qantas released there. Um, what quarterly profit of one point four billion dollars, and it just goes to show you how how much um, the demand for travel has in, increased. It doesn't matter whether you're able bodied or or uh, or not. There's just a big demand for it. So really great for for your business. Oh yeah, yeah. Being in a, a slump for for so long. Conversely, yeah. It, I, I mean, it is, but also you you think to yourself, well, if twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one were normal. Um, then you know a lot of the holidays that we get now are sort of just pent up demand, which would have been taken back then anyway. Yeah. So it's 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 one of those things that's a bit difficult to judge. Um, but yeah, I mean it was certainly a it was certainly a very challenging time, as you can imagine. I mean, you would have known as a personal trainer. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, that's right. Well, yeah. a little bit different for me because um, 
I mean, apart from you zooming with a, a back screen of you being in Paris or something and talking about Paris, you can't take anyone anywhere. I can still give people a, <laughs> uh, an experience, uh, you know, in health and wellness and uh, like the mental side of things, coaching. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah, that, that certainly wasn't open to us, unfortunately. So um, what's, what's next for you in terms of the business, apart from now getting these um, caravans and Winnebago's that are accessible <laughs> to uh, wheelchairs and so forth, what's next in terms of growing your business? Um, yeah, well, maybe, yeah, the Winnebago's is a great idea. Um, so I guess for us it's just a question of continuing to grow. Um you know, we've been pretty busy this year. Um, I can't remember how many holidays we've done. We've done a lot, but certainly over the next few months, um, it's um, just a question of continuing to consolidate what we've done with the business already. Um, we're looking at bringing in some new people in terms of like the management, so maybe a sales manager, so they can get out and tell tell our story a bit more in terms of you know what it is we do and what it is we offer. Because a lot of what a lot of what we do. And a lot of what we offer, even within the disability support industry, people don't know about it. So it's kind of like an education process in some respects. Yes. Um, it's just letting people know that we're, we're here, number yes. one. There's a lot of people who go, oh, what? Uh, you know, I had no idea that someone with a disability could go on holiday. And this can be someone that's, you know, works within the disability sector. Uh, so let alone sort of like the, the wider, wider general public. Um, and I guess... You know, we want to continue to, I suppose, I really want to continue to professionalise the service a bit more, you know, make it a bit more, I guess, uh, probably a bit more efficient. And also, hopefully, in the next few years, we're going to be buying up some more accessible property. So we're going to be looking at the Gold Coast at the moment. Um, so we want to get something which is entirely accessible for someone in a wheelchair. The Gold Coast is a hugely popular destination. Yeah, um and then look at other places around Australia that we could look at investing in. So we're going to continue with the travel um, and then also uh, definitely explore some more stuff with like the, the property, the, I guess the property side specialising in, you know, accessible accommodation. I, you know, I'm not interested in just buying investment properties that cool. aren't, you know, accessible. The market out there for people with mobility and so mobility issues and people in wheelchairs is huge it's just absolutely it's such an untapped market yeah. and you know to give you an example our house that we've got on phillip islands our respite center is four bedroom house you know it's got rolling bathrooms it's entirely accessible phillip islands got a um i think it's a population of about twelve thousand, roughly um but in summer as you probably know i mean oh, you know that's yeah it just, you know, it gets into like the hundreds of thousands with the GP and stuff like that. Um, you know, oh, there's probably about four places on the whole of Phillip Island that wow. can offer something similar to what we do. And they don't offer it as well as what we do. They don't have the facilities uh, and the accessibility that we do. Um, you know, especially some of the hotels, they'll say they're accessible, but they're really not. Um, so um, it's about providing that type of those type of services in those areas where people you know in wheelchairs want to go and you know the thing is this you know we do it obviously we, we offer the service because you know we want to provide it but also it's a great business decision you know yeah. because yeah you know, i mean as you know like property in australia like heaps of people have got investment properties um but you know with us it's like offering it with a bit of a difference i mean people you know who aren't in wheelchairs can stay no, they don't tend to, but you know, you know, it is open to them if if they wanted to. But we don't tend to yes. get any bookings. Specifically designed for all access. Absolutely, and you know, that, and that's you know, yeah, the clues in the name. It's it's an all access thing, and you know, it's being able to offer that to people um, that require it. So, yeah, like I said, it's just continuing to grow. It's continuing to go forward. You know, maybe offering new services, um, and you know, as you know. It's, you know, when you're running a business, you'll do something and then you'll see something that's coming up here and you go, oh, you know, well, why don't we try this? Why don't we offer this? Um, so it's quite an organic process um, as well. Um, and yeah, just just sort of just keep going with the clients we've got, keep getting new clients and then, yeah, keep offering holidays, I guess. 
Yeah, nice. I, I wanted to talk about relationships because you are in the relationship business uh, for in terms of the relationships you, with, that you need to build with your clients and I'm sure they um, they come back over and over again because of the experience and the relationship that you've built with them. Uh, you and I have uh, met through a local networking group and so forth, but I just wanted to get your your perspective in a you know unique uh, business, you know running a successful uh, successful business. Um, the importance that you place on building relationships and uh, I guess how you go about it. So, you know, like any other business, you know, relationships are pretty much fundamental to everything that you do, um, you know. But not everyone focuses on it, though, um, particularly yeah. um, like if I look at trades at the moment, for instance, like you, the, the trades are just so under the palm. We've had like you know all the, the floods and the, mm -hmm. you know, storm damage and whatever over the the years. It's like they just they don't care. It's like they'll charge you whatever. They can be slack. They can be dirty. They can be whatever. They don't care because I've got, I've got another job just coming around the corner, so it doesn't matter. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're not in the position of what the trades can offer. You know, and I know from personal experience, you know some of what the trades offer well some of them are just you know they don't turn up on time they don't you know they don't tell you they're not going to turn up you know mm. they expect to stay in the house all day waiting for them for in case they do decide to yeah, turn that's up that's right yeah. yeah it's really frustrating um with what we do you know say for example you're you know an elderly parent you're i don't know 70 years old you've got a child that's 40 years old they've got down syndrome they've never been on holiday their entire life without you by their side there's a lot of anxiety on the parents side it's probably a fair amount on the child's side um you know the parents getting older they realize they can't do this forever um so um the relationship that we create with that parent and with that child is fundamental because um you know they've really got to trust what we do and we do it well and that we're going to look after you know, their child is like, it's, it's like anything. So, you know, building those type of relationships with the parents is really important. Building that trust, you know, because mm -hmm. I often say that, you know, yeah, we're in the travel business and we provide support at holidays, but really what we do, we're in the trust business, I, yeah, I feel. Right. So how yeah. do you, like, how do you build that? How do you build that trust with the parent? Look, I think it's um, like any type of good business practice. It is delivering on what you say you're going to deliver. If you make mistakes, owning up to it, it's being honest, um, showing integrity, um, providing a good service and ensuring that, that you know, the, the, their clients or their kids, they want to come back. It's touching base regularly with them, you know. Um, Genuine care too, I imagine, given that. Yeah, you're the absolutely. Of... Look, you know, we do this as a business. But obviously, we care about the welfare of our clients who come with us. Absolutely. Mm. That's got to be the most fundamental part of what we do. We are there to ensure that they have a safe, secure, fun holiday. Yeah. You know, if we do that, then everything else follows on. You yeah. know, probably the core of our business, as you know, we're still continuing to grow, is our return customers. I've got clients that will come with us four times a year, you know. Yes. Um, so it's that sort of and you barely have to market to them because they already know what holidays you're doing they'll say okay i want to do this i want to do this i want to do this i'll write it all down these are the holidays i'm going to go on yes. um in other respects you know with other type of um i guess uh networking or whatever you know similar to like how we met in bni um there are specific networks for people you know with disabilities there's facebook forums um there's get togethers with people called support coordinators, NDIS workers, and it's just presenting what you've got. And then the other side of it is just, it's just being around. It's that longevity. You know, we've been here for, we've been here for seven years now. Yeah. We've made it through COVID. Um, the people that know what we do know that we do it well. I think it's a word of mouth thing. You know, we, by no, what we do, we are by no means the biggest. But I like to think that in the, the care that we provide and the type of people that we employ, um, you know, we really are the best at what we do. Um, you know, I've got a great team of carers that work for me and they're the type of people that really, really want to do this job. 
You know, then all the types of people are like, oh, you know, I just want to go out to Gold Coast. I want to have a holiday. They're like, they're the people that say, no, I want to take this person on holiday and I want to make sure that they have the best time. Yes. You know, um, and so I think it's just, you know, that um, the, you, the bread and butter of good businesses, it's almost like doing exactly the opposite of what, you know, modern day traders do in Australia. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, nice. <laughs> if you follow them, you're doing something right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, love that. You made some really good points there. Um, maybe briefly, you mentioned it there, so I'll explain it a little bit for our international news. You mentioned about um, NEIS, which is the National Disability and Insurance Scheme, if I got that right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so obviously you have built some really good relationships with um, the support workers and so forth in that scheme. Now, this is a it's in the news at the moment like it's a it's a bin, multi-billion dollar scheme that is funded by the taxpayer to help people um you know with disabilities uh, whether they be intellectual or physical ones to help provide them with services to improve the quality of their life now that can be a big beast and can be really difficult to get into something like that where you can get some supported fund or the clients that you're working with get the supported funding and so forth so maybe you could briefly talk about um you know, people in countries around the world even here in australia how do you go about forming those relationships with the key workers that are you know tied up in in such a big pool of funds from a business perspective so you know the ndis is yeah the national disability insurance scheme it was sort of its inception was about 2013 under the, the then gillard government and it, it's modeled on a similar uh similar sort of paradigm as they've got in the united kingdom um and it's basically set out so that each person with a disability has a tailored plan and sufficient funding within that plan so that they can achieve their goals, whether those yeah. goals be, you know, finding a job, uh, yeah. travel, um, yeah. learning a language, you know, learning yeah. skills, getting help. Any, any, any number of things to mm. enhance their quality of life. Prior to this, it was what was called block funding. And it was very sort of a top down approach uh, so that it was like, OK, this is your options. You've got you can go to a day center five days a week and, you know, sit and watch TV or, you know, maybe this is your other option and we'll take it to the shops or whatever. You know, it was, yes. it, was limited. It, it, it was very limited. It was very top down. It was a bit dictatorial. It didn't really give people that choice and control, which is what the NDIS is uh, ostensibly all about. Um, so in that respect, it's been really good. Um Another thing that's really good about the NDIS is that there has been a proliferation of uh, providers that will offer new and sort of innovative services. So, you know, like in, in your in your type of like personal training, uh, travel, uh, music therapy, um, you know, all types of different type things, you know, maybe getting out into the wild, outdoor camping and stuff like that, which has been opened up. Um, so it's taken a lot of the power away from the big providers and it's given it to smaller providers. Um, and it, it means that, you know, the market is in effect really, really working within the NDIS. It's a power of power of the market. Now it is funded by the taxpayer. Um, that being said, and it is, you know, it's a lot of money and that's true. And look, I mean, you know, is it going to grow? Most likely. I suppose what I would say to that is that if the NDIS isn't providing, you know, what is what are going to be the associated costs with those services not being there mm. as well? You know, we've got a gentleman that we work with. We see him once or twice a week. Um, you know, prior to the inception of the NDIS, he would spend a lot of his time in a psych ward. Okay. So, and I'm talking about months and years. Um, the cost Not of that. Of to, yeah, the cost to that, to the taxpayer, and then all the associated trouble that he may have with police or you know health yeah. authorities, housing, all the rest of it. It's shifting you know, it from one bucket to another, and this is a lot more empowering for the individual. Absolutely, and so yeah, in terms of you know how we market, how we network, it, it's just the same with you know um, other businesses. You know, there's an ecosystem that has been created with say support coordinators, support workers. You get the bigger organizations that maybe provide the housing, the residential support, and then you get organizations like mine and we'll go to the support coordinators who support clients. We'll say, hey, you know, we provide these holidays. 
they may have a caseload of 30 people and they go, oh, well, you know, I've got, you know, Ryan, he wants to go on a holiday here. You know, why don't we refer him over to all access holidays? Yeah. Uh, so um, in that respect, it's, it's it's been quite interesting in terms of like how it's created um, sort of like a real network of new businesses um, that have sprung up. Um, hopefully it will continue. It just depends on the funding. Um, yes, yeah, so we're it's, talking about that right now. They it's, are. It's going to be any adjustments to it. They're always talking about that, but also at the same time, like if they're going to do something about the funding, well, then what are they going to replace it with? Yeah, you that's know? right. That's the challenge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Look, the, I think the, what I love about what you do, I mean, it's got such a, like it comes from a, a great place from uh, from within you. Uh, you know, it's such a valuable service that not many people are, uh, are doing it out there. So I think, you know, like morally it comes from a, a really awesome place and it just provides such a unique service. I think from a business um, perspective, I think it's a really smart decision. You've been in it for like seven years now, gone through the rough times, yeah. learning a lot along the way, expanding the business, learning who the people are to, uh, you know, to be networking with and, and growing it. Um, and I think that's really cool because I, I don't see a lot of competitors coming into the space. You say you're not the, the biggest, just like I'm not the biggest, but it's about providing a gold standard in the service that you provide and people just love you know, love what it is that you do. I suppose my final question would be around, um, you know, what in terms of what we were talking before about what's next, is this business the sort of thing that you could get to a stage where, whether you say franchise it or, or not franchise it, but say take the model internationally so that's then let's say the US because that's probably the the next logical one and uh, to have people you know coming to Australia from the US doing a lots of experiences with the, within the US is it that that same sort of model that it is easily adaptable to to any country look i think it i mean it obviously it depends on the country somewhere like the US yes the UK um I guess you know for us it would be more sort of the Anglo sphere countries because of because of the language, um, I, and it depends on the type of models that they have there within within the support sector. So like the NDIS equivalent and so forth. Sure, and I don't yeah. you know somewhere like the states you know I mean there's fifty states I, I don't know what models they have so yes. uh, but I think it's definitely a, it could definitely be scalable. There's no reason why it couldn't. Do you be. have an appetite to do that, or do you do you think you'd rather stay? So I think at the moment what we want to do is, you know, we, we offer, um, you know, we offer, I don't know, maybe 50 odd holidays a year within Australia and a couple abroad. Um, so I want to be able to fill all those holidays first before we start looking at going international. Um, somewhere like maybe, yeah, New Zealand or the States or, or something like that, or, you know, even the UK um, could could be doable. Um, also, you know, we have helped international travellers when they've come to Australia. So, you know, yes. we, we've helped out people from India that have come from Taiwan. They're looking for accessible accommodation. They're looking for, you know, perhaps a bit of support. Um, so we do do that as well. It's not our main thing that we do, but yeah. we can certainly assist. Uh, um, well, I guess another from a late relationship perspective, it's, it's forming those good uh, relationships with the travel agents, isn't it? Because it's not like you're competing with them. You're providing a service that is really a nice one for people coming to them and saying, look, you know, we work with uh, with James from All Access Holidays, uh, you know, if you've got some special needs. Um, so is that something that you focus on too, building those connections? Yeah, we do a little bit. Um, to be honest with you, you don't find, and it's, it's a little sad really, you don't find that there's that many people that will come here that like internationally that maybe have mobility issues. Right. So it's not, it's not a huge market. Um, that right. being said, you know, we do work, you know, we worked with uh, we worked with a travel agent over in um, Andorra, of all places. Okay. Uh, he got in contact with us about uh, providing, you know, accommodation and transport for a gentleman in a wheelchair. So, uh, you know, and, you know, Joanne from uh, BNI, we do a little bit of work with her. Um, <clears throat> so it's definitely something to explore. But I, what I would say is that I think like now and in the future, it is going to be a growth growth area, mm. uh, you know. Especially, hopefully, people coming to Australia now that the borders are open. Um, so, um, it it will be something that we'll probably examine. It, it's just 
it's not one of those things where we get a heap, whole heap of referrals from, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's because we don't actively court it as well. Um, so sort of that chicken or egg thing, maybe if we went out, then. I, th- I think a lot of it's awareness, isn't it? I mean, I, was, yeah. I can't remember where it was. I mean, I think it's because of uh, the service that you provide. I was, I was somewhere the other day and I was standing there looking at the set. It might have been an accommodation place. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, anyone with a wheelchair cannot get in here. Mm-hmm. There was yeah. there was physically no way for them to mm-hmm. get in unless some a couple of people lifted them in the wheelchair up all these stairs. I yeah. thought, wow. And you know, I'm able bodied, bodied, you're able bodied, and we really take that for granted. And you know, it's just heightened my awareness. I think there, I was also at an eatery somewhere, or standing at the front of it and thinking, somebody that's got some access issues cannot get into this place. Mm-hmm. Sure. And how many people inside there recognise the fact that you can't, you know, can't get in here? And I, so I know that there are some countries. I spent um, yeah, a bit of time in the in the US, and there's so many places over there. Somebody that has access issues cannot get into these places, and some of them are big places. Yeah. Like even like um, obviously Disneyland's got some big open spaces and, and so forth, but I'm sure there are there are some some issues there as well where they can't you know they can't accommodate everybody's needs because there's steps and corridors are too narrow and and that kind of stuff so i think there is um certainly um a global education that needs to to take place um uh, 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 absolutely like for, we were in a couple of weeks ago we were in tasmania we were at the top of mount wellington and so, i don't know if you've been to the top of mount wellington i haven't got, they've got the well they've got these beautiful views from but they've got steps bang 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 bang, yes. bang, bang, bang. They go all the way down. So we had, <clears throat> I think we had like four guys on the holiday. Three of our guys had sort of, mo- well, sort of had mobility issues. They walked with walkers. There was no, no way, no way they were ever going to get down there. I get there. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, I always say it's, it's not just good from a moral, moral and ethical standpoint to provide access. It's actually really good for business as well. Yeah. You know, because you get so many more people that would go to that place. And, you know, like you probably noticed that because, you know, our relationship together and us talking together. Um, But imagine being someone that's in a wheelchair or someone with a walker. And that would be your daily lived experience every time they go out to a restaurant. Does it have access? Is there going to be a restaurant? When I wheel my wheelchair in there, is everything going to be so crammed together? Yeah, but I can't get through move through oh is there an accessible toilet you know it's all these sort of things that you know you and i take for granted we yeah, don't even think about right. for the most part um but they're the type of things that you know w- w- when we do our holidays that we're there to try and take that anxiety out because you'll find that you know a lot of people just they don't even want to start because yeah they I don't know it's too hard sure but they already like sometimes they're, they're, they're ex- they've had such terrible experiences i mean you know, even, you know, in Melbourne, you know, some of our trains aren't accessible. You know, some of our buses aren't accessible. You know, we 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 sort of pride ourselves or we, you know, we say, oh, you know, we're the most livable city in the world. And it's like, well, how livable can you be if you've got like a part of the population that can't even get on a bloody bus, you yeah. know? Yes. So. Yeah. I mean, the, um, I, again, the the great benefit that somebody coming to you you just take all of that out because you're not going to take them somewhere where they can't get into and so that anxiousness of gee i'd really like to take you know my my child or whatever on a, on a holiday but i just don't even know where to start sure um so this has been awesome james i, I love the work that you do and um you know if i'm ever walking down a dark alley in melbourne i want you by my side because <laughs> you're um well let's just touch on on that really briefly because i'm obviously i'm a, a very big person in terms of making sure that people are living their best life and the importance of health and wellness <clears throat> as not just for the physical you but the mindset as well so i know that you're into the martial arts and so forth so just um maybe for the benefit of everybody that doesn't believe me um what what do you think your martial arts and your focus in in that space and health and wellness does for you in helping you perform better in business oh well i mean the benefits of exercise and wellness are just so sort of like multifaceted i do jiu-jitsu brazilian jiu-jitsu i've done it for about the last six years 
yeah. prior to that, I did Kyoki Shin Karate. Um, <clears throat> I suppose with Jiu Jitsu, it keeps you fit, number one. Um, you know, it's probably going to be one of the hardest things that you're ever going to do. When you've got some guy trying to choke you out, um, most other things sort of um, don't seem that important. Having significance, um, yes. It gives you, uh, I find that, you know, and you'd find this too, you know, for me, my martial arts, weightlifting and stuff like that, um, it's kind of like my medication, Yeah, you know, because... I the the dopamine hit that I get after, yeah, just makes me yeah. feel so much better about myself. Um, and even if I haven't tra- if I haven't trained for a few days, then I can feel it in myself. My wife can notice. You know, I'm sort of, you know, my temp. I you know I get bad tempered. I get you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, ironically, I'm almost more tired when I haven't been training. Yeah, that's right. So, and you'd be worse at work too. You just can't concentrate absolutely. as well. So the benefits of it are just, you know, I, I feel more yeah. energized. I feel more motivated. I feel like I'm constantly trying to achieve something. You know, I'm getting older. I'm, you know, I'm 42 now. Um, I'm training with a load of guys that are sort of in their 20s and their 30s. Um, and I can still keep up. That makes me feel good. Um, mm. And it's a lifelong learning process. It's a lifelong yeah. thing where, you know, just because I'm, you know, getting a little older, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop. It just means I'm going to continue going. Yeah. Um, and I also think, if you know, if I didn't do my martial arts, if I didn't lift my weights, if I didn't do anything like that, I'd, I'd, I'd be an absolute mess. Um, you know, I'd probably be, I'd probably be coming on one of my holidays and <laughs> not running them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice work. Hey, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the the best way to do? We've mentioned the website, but I'll put it below the the podcast as well. But what's the best way for people to get in touch? Is it just the website? Or? Yeah, so it'll be the website. Check us out on social. So we're on Facebook under All Access Holidays. We're on Instagram, All Access Holidays. Um, yeah, and, and the website. Um, uh, well, I think we're also on LinkedIn as well. It's not one of our bigger socials. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah, um, cool. yeah Instagram's a really good good place to get, on, uh, get in touch with us. You can also follow a lot of our holidays that we do and, and stuff like that. And Facebook, you can see the holidays that are up, up and coming. So, yeah. Just yeah, nice. I've seen your brochure. It looks great. You've got some great holidays out there. And look, anyone listening to this, any country in the world, if you're coming to Australia and you want to go on a, a really unique a holiday, an all-access one, then James is your man. James, it's been a great call. Thanks so much for adding all your insights to uh, your business. Keep doing the, the great work you're doing. And, um, you yeah, know, let's get those Winnebago's and um, caravans <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should do it together it was your yeah, idea not right. mine <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Thanks, thanks, James. great to speak awesome. to you cheers Rob see you mate